Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to the Radults Podcast, the podcast that highlights the stories of people who said fuck that to the idea that growing up means giving up on your dreams and instead turn those dreams into their reality. Today's guest is Tim Biggs. Tim has been researching and writing about video games for more than 10 years. He completed his master's thesis on the place of games in social theory and has had articles appear on the likes of IGN and Kotaku. He's currently the technology editor at the Age and Sydney Morning Herald, where he writes weekly reviews and has travelled the world chasing gaming scoops. He also covers more serious tech and issues. Tim is also a dad, making him another one of our dadults. Tim Biggs is a radult, and he is our guest on Radults Today. And welcome back to Radults. We're here today with Tim Biggs. Tim, thanks for joining the podcast. Now, who are you and what do you do? Uh, well, yeah, I, I am Tim Biggs. I, uh, I write words about video games and I, I report news about technology. What, what sort of got you going with that? Like, what made you, I guess, know that you had, you know, a spark to do that and had what it took to, uh, to make a living out of, as you said, words? Yeah, so I, I, guess, I guess it started as like two separate things where I had, you know, I had video games always in my life, but uh, on, the other, on the other side, I think writing um, and creating sort of, um, you know, content that way was the only thing I was actually really uh, that good at. You know, at school, I certainly wasn't good at, you know, science or math or, or anything like that. But, you know, in, in terms of creating stories and, you know, and, and noting them down, that's something I was good at. But it wasn't until... I guess I was halfway through university for journalism that I kind of realized you you could do that for video games. You know, obviously I knew that people wrote about it because I, I read a lot of stuff about video games, but it it didn't really occur to me that, you know, I could do that. Uh, so I guess from there it was just a, a case of, you know, doing it. You know, you sort of got to sort of get started uh, just doing stuff. You know, I read stuff for my own blogger for like really small like indie blogs or whatever and eventually um you know I, I started a master's degree and I decided that was going to be mostly about video games and that gave me a bit of a you know a unique point of view to start pitching stories to IGN um and a few other places and and I guess it just sort of it kept going from there I, I kind of realized that not many other people were doing it so um you know whenever there was a, a space that I could be you know, writing about games, creating content about games, that's what I was doing. Now, you managed to to segue from doing your master's, you actually did your thesis um, on games in, in social theory, the place of games in social theory, uh, and you managed to end up as the, the technology editor at The Age and Sydney Morning Herald. Now, those two things don't seem immediately connected. How did you make that transition? <laughs> They're extremely not connected. I, I'm sure most people at work would be, uh, I don't know, nonplussed to to know that about me. They're not a not a whole lot of people, um, sort of openly interested in in that particular cross section of things at work. I think, but uh, I guess the way it happened was that I was really interested in in philosophy and and social theory, um, you know, and understanding the way people see and interpret the world and as a form of, of, you know, literary criticism as well. But on the other hand, um, sort of applying that stuff to games is, is a pretty recent phenomenon. I, I'm sure, you know, the people who grew up playing games a lot, um, most of them now are sort of, you know, in their, in their thirties and forties. So it's, it's only recently that they've sort of been in a place to do that kind of research. So, um, I was really interested in um, postmodern social theory, uh, particularly uh, Jean Baudrillard. It's it's all about how um, how our, our minds sort of create the world before we actually uh, see it for ourselves, and and how what that does, you know, to society. But uh, Baudrillard died before video games was sort of a, a big thing, so he was sort of around up until the nineties. And yeah, I just thought it would be really interesting to sort of, sort of try to fit video games in, you know, the way he he described the world. Sort of what what do video games have to do with the way uh, people construct the world in their brains and the way they sort of perceive everyday life? And also, uh, 
do we do that the same in video games? I think there's a lot of talk all the time about video games being, you know, simulations or people, especially who don't play video games, will often say things like, you know, that person is killing a person, you know, in a video game when actually um, I would say that they're not doing anything of the sort. But, you know, what is what is the difference there and what, how does that sort of all work is really, you know, what I was trying to look at. Um, and then how that ended up getting me into the age, like I said, um, pretty much nothing to do with it. I was already working uh, nights doing some very sort of low-level boring stuff at the age um, uh, at, while I was doing my master's uh, and sort of freelancing for, for games-focused places, you know, on the side. And then eventually there was an opportunity to work on the technology team uh, at the age who at the time were very focused on, you know, gadgets and, and social media and stuff like that. Um, so I took that job and then just over time sort of brought as, as much video game stuff into it as I could. Yeah, I think it's definitely, um, something that is sort of playing a little bit on my mind recently, especially with, uh, the isolation that a lot of people are, uh, going through at the moment, which is, uh, like you touched on before, uh, I've played video games my whole life, you know, before I could walk, I was playing Legend of Zelda on the NES and, uh, Super Mario 3 and all that. Um, so I've always had video games in my life. I've always, you know, considered myself a gamer before, I guess, uh, it gained the popularity that it sort of has, like maybe like due to social media and the likes of visual content like Instagram. Uh, but at the same time, where, like, where do you think that that sort of, um, surge in popularity and let's say like more so the last five years has come from and do you think it will still like do you think it will still increase over time or do you think that there will be a a decline in that at all yeah it's interesting because i mean if you if you look at sort of the genesis of of video games i think you know you might assume that they come of, of a hybrid medium of sort of film and, and technology and, or something like that but i think probably further back it's more to do with you know games that people played whether it's sports or whether it's you know weird things that children do or whether it's um chess stuff like that so i think in that sense um they're they're never going to go away it's just that everything at the moment is technological and and video based and input based so that's how our games work but in terms of um, in terms of video games as we understand them, you know, consoles, uh, etc. I think the the boom really came from uh, you know a few years ago. No one had smartphones, right? iPhones yeah. weren't a thing. Um, Nintendo had the had the DS, which was a a huge hit because it's just like you know it's a video game. You can take it on the go. People who don't necessarily sit at home a lot of the time in front of their TV, they've got a thing they can play video games on. And it sort of just went along that vein for a while. You know, Nintendo followed up with the Wii, which is like, you know, this is something for your home, but it's not as intimidating as it used to be. Everyone can play it. The sort of pool of people that play video games grew by, by billions and billions of people. And then there's a whole generation that sort of grew up in that. And so now they're perfectly comfortable with a, you know, a PlayStation 4. For a, for a long time, people were predicting that video games as we knew them were going to disappear and be replaced by smartphone apps. Uh, and it just didn't happen. Um, and I, I guess there's a, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that, but looking at it now, you know, the, the industry has never been more healthy. It's never been more diverse. Uh, I think we're starting to realize that everyone enjoys playing games and with video games specifically, it's just a matter of, you know, overcoming that initial friction of, how do I interface with it and how do I learn the rules? Um, and once you pass that, it, you know, it's, it is something that everyone enjoys. So in the near term, I, I think it's only going to get bigger and bigger. And, and as you mentioned, there's sort of a whole new world now of, you know, sharing and, and consuming that way. And with new technologies like um, Google Stadia, apparently within the next few years, we're going to get to a point where you can log on to, whatever we use for social media, see that I'm playing a game, watch me playing it live, jump in multiplayer, like with me at the same time. It's just going to be, you know, a great big social thing that everyone does, I think. 
Yeah, it's. I mean, obviously, we're we're still a little bit away from that. You know, there's a lot of uh, controversy and a lot of uh, shade being thrown the stadium away. Uh, I guess not being people aren't uh, thinking that it's coming. Uh, it's meeting what it its expectations were. So, but do you think that there's something with the company as as, as big as Google? Uh, do you think that they can, I guess, heal from, I guess, the detrimental uh, sort of reputation that the Stadia currently has? I mean, Google in particular, if they want to do it, they'll do it. Um, they sort of, they've got endless, you know, resources. Um, it's it's more a case of whether they're going to have the drive to to stick in it for the long term. I mean... They're, they're notorious for, you know, starting projects and getting them going and then just dumping them because they're not working out, you know, as well as they'd like to. But I think that technology, um, it, it'll get there eventually. At the moment, it's clearly early. I mean, I don't know too many people with the kind of internet that would, you know, work with something like that um, and work with it, you know, as well as it could. And more broadly than that, it's an, it's an infrastructure issue. But, um, yeah, I think eventually... It's always going to be the case that there are enthusiasts who want local hardware to, you know, get the most fidelity that they can uh, and have the most control over it that they can. But it just makes too much sense to offload all of that onto the people that have giant, you know, processing servers and just have people, you know, gamers on the end of it using whatever device they want um, and, and being able to connect to everything else in the world, you know, instantly it, I, I feel like it's it's gonna happen <laughs> i kind of hope it happens because as a musician uh i saw the transition happen between in uh purely physical formats being the only option you had uh and that transition through to uh digital being the primary form of uh of purchasing or of st- occur uh, and at first it was quite confronting as I think it would be for the games industry if all, all of a sudden there was no consoles, and there was no local hardware, I'm pretty sure the industry would find an attack to start with. Uh, but in the long run, it's ended up being better for the music industry in terms of more people being able to produce quality content that's accessible to everyone. And I think that's probably the future for gaming. And you're fortunate enough to be in a position where you get to see it coming. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, imagine if we had a situation where no one could go down to the store to buy video games. That would be pretty weird, right? Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, but it, it's, it is one of those things where I, I feel like there will be a democratization because that, that comes... I guess the difference is that creating games, um, there's there's a bit more of a, of a technological sort of... Um, burden where you know there's a lot of people don't have the uh, resources you know Uh, but I I think that's going to change also in the future game development tools are only getting more and more accessible and more and more powerful so I think once that um, you know physical distribution model is is totally gone or almost totally gone uh, and we do have those creation tools that are a lot more feasible you will see a lot more people and we're seeing that already i mean indie games 10 years ago barely existed um whereas now some of the greatest games every single year um some of the most interesting and the most evocative um the most important uh are all indie games and so yeah i don't see any reason why that wouldn't continue to be the case yeah i mean look massive shout out to the indie game celeste I think mm-hmm. that that's just completely shattered things, but I I do I do think that uh, while the game industry is obviously trying to uh, continue going and uh, like you said, uh, it's becoming more readily available for uh, people to start developing their own games. You've also it's kind of there's been some times where there's been. Uh, a ball and chain with that sort of stuff. Uh, the notorious uh, debacle that went through Blizzard when, like, pretty much, like, uh, the game Dota was made, like, from, like, mods and maps of of a Blizzard game and obviously uh, became 
like a highly popular game. And then you're going through right now, uh, Nintendo is uh, on the the Dream server on uh, PS4 trying to shut down any creator creating like Mario games. Uh, do you think that that's hurting or hindering the games industry that they could sort of have like a heavy hand with that or, you know, are they like just well within their right and that's what they should be doing? Um, well, I think, I think there's always uh, a case of, you know, a, a lot of, you know, borrowing going on. I mean, you don't have to look at what happened with um, PUBG and when, then with Fortnite, you know, one of those games is a lot more successful than the other. Um, and, and, you know, the, the originator was a much smaller outfit and then a larger outfit came around and said, you know, we can do this better. And it, and it does work the other way around as well. I think the Mario example may be a little bit different because that's a, that's a intellectual property. You know, if, if you wanted to go and make a game that functioned a lot like Mario, um, I think you'd probably get away with it, but actually having his face, and you know, uh, you know, bits and bits and pieces from uh, an actual video game i don't know whether it comes down to it they're within their rights or not but i think the way a lot of the things work is they yeah they have to do that um they have to protect their their copyrights you know it's just part of part of being a big corporation uh but i think you know i think over time you'll get a lot more um when people can make stuff so easily you'll get a lot more things where it's like you know this big companies made a new game and now here's a bunch of indie takes on that same concept and they all have something different to say or like here's the best indie game of the world and now you know ea is gonna is gonna try their hand at doing something similar um and and as to whether uh you know someone with the most money is always going to have the most successful product i guess that remains to be seen but at the moment it's certainly not the case so um i guess we'll just have to see how that shakes out Definitely. I wonder if the the constant innovation and the constant evolution is one of the things that attracted you in the first place to to this space. Um, is that something that that inspired your decision to to write about games and to make this your career? The fact that it was an area that would always be changing. So it's an interesting idea. I think. It's tough because honestly, like personally, I, I'm still into the same games that I was into when I was like 14 years old. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know exactly why that is. I mean, some of it's nostalgia, but I think some of it's also um, just they're, they're not simpler, but they're, they're more apparent. Like you've got like, you know, four different buttons. You start a game, you press all the buttons. And you're like, I understand how this works. And then sort of the game builds from there. Whereas... You know, now a game can be literally anything. Um, but there, there certainly is something exciting about, you know, the progression of technology. And uh, certainly in times past, you know, new consoles would come out and it would be um, a whole new ball game. You know, uh, the, the company that was on top last time could just completely eat shit and be taken over by someone else, which has happened like every generation for the last, you know, five or so generations. Um, or it could just be a, a totally new idea, um, you know, like the Wii, or it could just allow games that you've, you've never seen before. Um, so that is, that is something that's very interesting. And from a, from a news point of view, I mean, that's what, that's what keeps us going, right? Even just very recently, uh, PlayStation was like, here's the controller for the next PlayStation. And everyone was just sort of like, you know, losing their minds about it. And, and it's, you know. <laughs> It's yeah. just how it works. It's, it's, it's not necessarily not... anything new, but you know, that's, <laughs> you want those details. This is what I'm going to be playing for the next five years. You know, I want that button with the lines, and I don't know what it does, but it's you know, it's new. Yeah, I I'm actually like really like uh, head first in this sort of stuff. So I'm generally one of those gamers that tends to buy a console uh, on day one. Uh, you know, pay it off as leads up to it. Now, uh, a lot of people know about the Xbox One uh, uh, debacle back when that was, like, launched, uh, you know, saying you couldn't, like, trade games, all this sort of stuff. Uh, and that hurt the console early on, I think. Uh, and that was... I was like, no way am I getting that. I'm getting the PS4. Uh, and now, like you said, 
we're going through that again where now Xbox has laid everything on the table. They've showed the console. They've showed the controller. They uh, announced their specs like pretty much all at once uh, and explained like in depth what each thing was uh, and pretty much just said like read them and weep to PlayStation. And now you've got PlayStation who's like, oh, here's some of our specs. Uh, this is aimed at developers and... Here's a controller a couple of weeks after. We have no idea what it's looking like or anything like that, uh, except for like dev kits and some uh, some production drawings that could or could not be real. You know, uh, are we are we going to see like uh, another thing where uh, the tables have turned with this? Do you think that Xbox this time round will come out on top? Well, I think you forgot to mention that the PlayStation did also show off a PS5 logo quite early in the game. So <laughs> yeah. there, there is something to be said for that. But, yeah, okay, uh, yes. How could I forget that? <laughs> props for the logo. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it does seem to go in cycles. Every time I think that we're past this kind of thing and that video games are just going to be like movies or music that they, you know, they're just continuous, um, you know, it seems like we're still stuck in this loop. And, I mean, you can go back as far as you like. Um, you know, Super Nintendo, great. 64 didn't do a whole lot. Got got completely, you know, bashed by, by PlayStation. Uh, and then, you know, PS2, best thing in the world, still the, the highest-selling game console. And then PS3, um, you know, what did they do? They came out and they said, you know, we know it's, you know, a million dollars, but you'll get a new job or whatever. And, like, we don't care. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, 360 destroyed them and then nintendo was like we're doing something totally different this time and they they beat everybody and it just sort of it goes like that and and this time uh i don't know i don't know if you could really say someone's gonna win like uh, i think from the point of view of the people you know consuming all this nitty-gritty detail it's it's pretty easy to see that um microsoft is is in a much stronger you know position to sort of grab those, those hearts and minds. But from a mainstream position, I mean, uh, the PS4 just has so many more people. There are, there are so many more people in the PlayStation ecosystem right now. From Sony's point of view, they probably don't have to do a lot. Like, when it comes to buying the next console, assuming they're both out relatively at the same time, I think for most people, it's going to be, you know, the, the ecosystem that they know that's going to drive the, the purchasing decision and it's not going to matter whether xbox has the more powerful machine which it appears that it does or the more you know user friendly and and consumer friendly platform which it appears that it does um you know it could just be the case that and i mean not to not to take anything away from sony they have the strongest um you know bunch of studios in the world xbox has been buying them up they've got a lot of people we haven't really seen what they can do yet so PlayStation might have the games and the, the huge, you know, millions and millions more people supporting it. So it's, it's definitely uphill from Xbox. But, I mean, as we've already said, every single generation previous, the person who was the underdog in one generation tends to be the one on top next time. And I don't know whether that's through hubris or just because of some quirk of, you know, business. Um, so I would, I would tentatively say that Xbox is going to wind up with the more impressive machine and it's probably going to be the one most of us use for our, um, you know, third party titles. But I think PlayStation, it can't really be counted out in terms of having the hugest exclusives and, you know, the most mainstream appeal. Yeah. And continuing on and making this more like bringing it back more with your career as well uh, and touching on announcements as we've been talking about. How has, in this situation that uh, the world's currently going through with uh, COVID-19, how has the cancellation of things like uh, the various PAX Expos, the E3 Expo and everything like that, how has that affected your job? Mm -hmm. So... I, I've been off work for a while. I, I just came back recently because I, I had a baby. So we were sort of, you know, in, in baby mode. And then the world kind of fell apart while I was off, which was, you know, good timing in, in some respects. And then so I've got back to work and it's 
it's it's interesting because I think specifically working at uh, well what used to be called Fairfax, it's like the my propensity to write about video games sort of ebbs and flows uh, depending on what else is happening in the world. And this is definitely the kind of situation where I don't expect to be writing too much about video games for a while, apart from reviews, which I which I do every week. Um, there's just sort of there's too much going on, and I'm definitely more looking out for you know, how, how has the coronavirus um, affected the way, you know, just basic technological systems work? How is it affecting our lives? And video games are certainly a part of that. I mean, a lot of people are coping being cooped up by, by playing video games. It'd be very interesting to see how consumer behavior has changed. How, like, are people buying more? Are people playing more? Um, what kind of things are they playing uh, but in terms of my job, it's really just work to de-emphasize video games quite a bit. Uh, and also, obviously, I won't be going to E3. I've been the last uh, four years in a row. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens this year in terms of you know, publishers trying to get the, the word out um, or whether they'll have anything to get the word out about. I mean, um, certainly a lot, of, a lot of indies are in a great spot to be able to publish games now and, and get them seen. But someone like Sony, I mean, who just indefinitely pushed back two of their biggest uh, upcoming games for the first half of 2020, pushed them back to we, we don't even know when. Uh, and I assume because there are no retail stores to put the games into and there's a lot of uncertainty about who's playing games, who has money to buy games, what everyone's doing. So it is a, it is a very interesting time. Uh, in a sense, I kind of wish I was working somewhere that only covered video games, so I had an excuse to say, you know, well, I'm spending all this week finding out exactly what people are buying instead of their usual thing. Um, for me, I, I guess it's a bit more, you know, a um, bit more big picture since we've got such a such a mainstream audience. But it's it's definitely changed basically everything about the the video game industry. I mean, even the concept of these huge teams, someone making, you know, The Last of Us or someone making the next Legend of Zelda game or Halo, the fact that they're all doing it from their homes now has got to be uh, a situation that they had has barely even considered ever. Um, how do you move the kind of files that they need to move around? How do you have the sort of interpersonal communication that you're used to having? And even from a community and an indie point of view, how do you get your foot in the door when you don't have things like PAX and E3, when you don't have your game in front of people saying, here's the controller, here, play it. I think everyone in the industry is kind of trying to work out how to do those things right now. So it'll be very interesting come E3 time, whether we will have people sort of distributing demos and, and having you know live streams or whether things are basically going to be shut down and they're going to say, all right, well, Maybe PS5 is next year, and we're just gonna <laughs> we're just gonna bunker down for a while. Yeah, I mean the biggest devastation to come out of out of all this. I mean, uh, taking uh, death toll aside there, and all the illnesses <laughs> is That's the fact biggest. that uh, <laughs> we don't have The Last of Us Part Two coming out. Like that. That's just a travesty. Yeah, it's uh, it's a big deal because I mean it had already been delayed once, I think. Um, which is part of the course for for a Naughty Dog game, but the, the you know the the general wisdom would be well it can't be delayed again they're definitely going to put it out but you know for whatever reason and it doesn't seem like it's because the game's not finished it's just that for whatever reason they they don't want to put it out they think that waiting is going to work out better for them um, business wise and so yeah I I can only hope that that doesn't sort of have a knock on effect to every other big game that's supposed to come out for the rest of the year. Is this happening? Do you think that like a game like this being delayed, and I'm sure like Cyberpunk is going to get delayed again? Uh, do you think that the delay is because they know that uh, there would be a day one update? That in Australia alone, with everyone doing work from home, MBN wouldn't allow us to like update this game, so therefore we wouldn't be able to play it. <laughs> <laughs> that that would definitely be an issue. I don't know if. If Sony really cares that much about that, um, I, I have to imagine it's got to do with the number of people they know uh, 
get physical copies of their games. Like they, they have to have data on what the breakdown is between physical versus digital. Um, and I guess they're just not seeing um, for a game that they've put so many millions and millions of dollars of and they've supported the, you know, development for what, four years or something like that. I guess to them waiting six months and pulling the trigger then and making more money is going to be worth it. Um, you know, they're going to cop a lot of flack from people, you know, who, who want to play the game now, but, you know, by next year, there's going to be new consoles out. Um, there's going to be all sorts of stuff happening. I guess they don't want to release it now and then try to get those people back in the future. They'd rather wait for their big, you know, big hit, big marketing spend. And I mean, you've got to look at that too. People aren't out and about. They're consuming media in a very different way than they usually do. Some of it could just be uncertainty. Yeah, it's definitely a weird time. I wonder for you, as a as a journalist, uh, obviously your your job involves pivoting quite a bit in, in instances like this. And at the moment, I've been reading some of your articles about uh, how people should safely use House Party in Zoom and uh, how uh, Animal Crossing is the perfect antidote <laughs> to a life indoors, among other things. Uh, that sort of pivot is that a balance that you find hard as as a writer, and is that something that you would say to aspiring writers to get good at being able to be flexible like that? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, personally, the ideal situation wouldn't involve as much of that, right? Like, I'd be, I'd be writing for for some sort of magazine that couldn't possibly exist. That's just for old men like myself about how to get the best, you know, visual clarity out of your Atari 2600 or something of, of that nature. Um, and I could write about the same thing every week and it wouldn't matter. But yes, in, in a newsroom situation, that is just part of, um, just part of what you have to do with every single story because uh, it's, and I mean, it's, it's a fine line, right? And even, even in my workplace, we sort of went through that transition period where for a while everything was about uh, clicks and it was about, you know, whatever the thing was that people were talking about, you have to make the story about that because that's what's going to get the clicks. And we don't really do that as much anymore, but still you have to meet the audience where they are. And if there's something that they are thinking about and something that they're worrying about, um, it is worth taking that into consideration when you are, you know, planning out the stories. And with the with the Animal Crossing, I mean, that was a, that was a review. So most of the story was just about Animal Crossing would have been the same if I had written it, you know, six months ago. But it is it is a good way in, especially because that was my mindset most of the time when I was playing it. Uh, and I'm sure it makes it sort of uniquely appealing to people at the moment. Uh, and I, I guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to say that every story everyone has to write now has to be about, uh, you know, COVID. But it, it certainly pays to take into account the mindset of people reading it. And by that same token, I I personally think that there are probably a lot of people out there who don't want to read about it right now and who look at, you know, the the homepage of the Age of the Sydney Morning Herald and sort of scroll past the the big, you know, three quarters of the page that's to do with the coronavirus looking for anything else to read about. So I think that's important as well. Um, but the, the lesson for, you know, for aspiring writers is, you know, you are going to have to find angles to your stories you're gonna to have to find ways to to sell the story and that involves you know getting contextual cues like that up top to remind people you know this is the this is the context this is what it means and that goes through to you know even the ability to pitch a story to the people who decide where stories go you know not to get too inside baseball but if i'm writing a story I need to be able to communicate to the people on the homepage why it's important or why someone might want to read it. And a lot of that is tying it into the current news agenda and, you know, what people are looking for in the moment. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I read your Animal Crossing uh, article that Brenton mentioned, uh, being a Switch player. Uh, I got that on launch day and everything like that. And, you know, even down to your heading, uh, we you know, hit the nail on the head with that. And I've seen uh, on Instagram and on Facebook and Twitter how many people have pretty much 
you know, said that. Almost just that. They're going, like, if it weren't for Animal Crossing, dot, 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 you know, uh, and in this time, you know, there's, there's so many people calling this game a lifesaver, so many people saying that, it, it, you know, it couldn't have been, you know, a, a more apt game to drop there, like what you mentioned in your uh, in your article, you know, saying that, you know, it's, you know, by coincidence that's happened. But then you've also got another game like Doom Eternal that drops on the same day that you don't have people say, like, Doom Eternal. Eternal <laughs> saved my life or anything like that like do you do you think that animal crossing and i know for instance the console and the game itself like uh just based on pre-orders was selling out of eb games like at a ridiculous thing do you think that something as morbid uh, as you've said there and the coincidence has actually boosted the sale of this game mm. well i mean it is it is an interesting sort of uh, dynamic with with Doom Eternal. I was um I was on leave when Doom came out, and and covering for me at the time was um Dave Milner, who used to edit uh, Game Informer, and he's he's a he's an awesome writer. And his sort of take on Doom, at least his intro, was kind of like, you know, the world's the world's been been decimated by this you know demonic infection, and and the government sort of has fumbled every attempt to stop it. And there's also a new Doom game out. Uh, which it's like the, the sort of the realities of the the game and and our own you know lived experience sort of had a weird crossover, um, but it, it is interesting. People have the choice; they can play that where you know the the world's been decimated by something, and then demons have appeared, and then you can go kill them and sort of take some control in a in a situation where a lot of people don't feel like they have any control, or you can play this other thing where there's basically nothing bad in existence. Um, and, and even, you know, even having to take out a mortgage or getting stung in the face by wasps is kind of a pleasant thing to happen to you during your day. Um, and that's the thing that, that people really overwhelmingly um, have gone for. So I think there is something, you know, people aren't really will not ready yet. I think to really face uh, what's happening and and even pretend like they're taking some sort of control over it. We're happy to sort of say, uh, okay, yes, yes, government, I will I will stay in my house and and we'll do whatever you say. Trust you to deal with that. I'm going to be propagating some tulips and talking to the elephant that moved into my neighbourhood, uh, and sort of that will be my my couple of weeks. Uh, and Animal Crossing, I mean, it's it's such a perfect fit for that kind of thing. I mean. Not to say that people are, <laughs> are self-medicating with, with Animal Crossing, but it's, it's that kind <laughs> of game where even before, you know, the virus stuff, people were sort of being like, this is my year sorted, I'm turning everything off, I'm living in Animal Crossing, I'm not going to stop until I can, you know, make the, the island of my dreams and I'm going to do this and I'm going to get KK Slider to come and play a, you know, gig at my town or whatever, and it's sort of... It, there was already that level of commitment of people wanting to dive into it and have it be their life. Um, because for whatever reason, and I don't know if it's because the world's particularly bad now or if because of something to do with, um, you know, the way social media works, that's just our default to say everything's terrible. Um, yeah, people were, were ready to just chuck in their entire lives and, and live in this sort of fancy-free um, raccoon nightmare uh, and and they have they've been given the perfect opportunity and and I've been playing it a lot as well and it it is really I don't know if cathartic is the right word because I definitely get stressed out playing Animal Crossing which I know you're not supposed to do um, but I mean there's you know there's turnip prices to be to be considered and and all sorts of you know things like that and and whether I can get a, a raincoat of a different color because I don't like the raincoat that I have um, it's 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 another another bunch of worries to concern yourself with that are nowhere near as concerning uh, as, as the real world. And I think that's what, you know, what gets people about it. Yeah. I mean, I've been uh, guilty of putting in a minimum of three hours a day into Animal Crossing right now. Uh, there's obviously home loans to pay off. Uh, so, <laughs> and they're not going to pay themselves off. Uh, and then you've got, I mean, look, I think that we're also turning a blind eye to the release of Resident Evil 3, like the remake, uh, where you've got a city that decides that 
if you don't get out, we're getting firebombed. So it's kind of like, eh, you know what, I'll go back to this island because I don't want to think about the fact that technically maybe that should be happening in cities now. But, you know, it's all that sort of thing. So, um, Yeah, the starting of, of Resident Evil 3 is is pretty confronting. I, uh, I'm i supposed to review it next week, so I really should have played more of it. But it's, it's that kind of game where I can only play it in the middle of the night because I have a three-year-old who sort of, only wants to watch everything that I'm I'm doing, and I'm like, you can't you can't be here for this. You need to, you need to go to bed. <laughs> but the starting of it is like uh, is like live action, right? And it's like yeah. it's like news reports and stuff. And maybe for the first couple of minutes, it, it just looks like the news. Um, they're just they're a, and then it sort of you know it gets really extreme after that, where um, you know they're doing that thing that they love to do in movies, where they're loading important people onto the you know helicopters and getting out of the city and everyone else has been like, why well, can't stay here? We're going to turn into zombies. And sort of, it sort of gets insane, but it is funny walking around that city and, and, you know, you think, well, it wouldn't take much to, to kind of get us there. You know, we don't have zombies, but we could certainly have, you know, looters or um, you see in the UK already, people have taken it upon themselves to start destroying um, telecommunications equipment because someone on YouTube said that 5G and the coronavirus are linked somehow. Um, people are just sort of primed primed to explode in, in situations like this. So it is funny. I also did go into a convenience store in Resident Evil 3 and saw that they had toilet paper on the shelf. So it's, it is a, quite a bit different from uh, reality in that respect. Yeah, that's where you see Nevesis <laughs> does one of his jump punches through a wall and just grabs a roll and then just goes away again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, but it is also like that. I, I was watching um, like a playthrough uh, that a guy that I like was doing and um, he was like showing he's walking down and it's like pretty much like an empty street. Uh, except that, you know, there's a couple of dead people, uh, you know, on the road. You know, there's some cars on fires and stuff like that. But I couldn't help, and this is going to sound horrible and I don't mean it in a horrible way, but I couldn't help going... I've seen, like, photos like this on the internet, you know, of, like, Italy, you know, where there's been people passed out or, you know, deceased, you know, in in the street from all this, and they've put these photos up there, and it's hard to see that a fictional virus, like the T-virus, can be compared to something that the world's going through now. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, if the timing was a bit different, um, Capcom probably would have thought twice about about releasing the game for that reason. I think there is there's a few things that um, that kind of seem in bad taste given given the current situation, but I mean, you, you can't blame them. There's, there's obvious games obviously been in development for, for a couple of years, but yeah, you're right. And even even things that are a bit more, you know, campy, like, um, you know, there'll be a situation where someone's being bitten by a zombie and they'll be trying to pretend that they're not bitten because they need to go to a place and they don't want everyone to think that they're going to, you know, catch the virus off them and then everyone's freaking out. It's kind of like, well, that's kind of how it is. You know, if, if I'm mowing my lawn outside and, and someone tries to come in the house, I'm going to freak out. Cause I'm like, you know, we're not supposed to be near people. You know, there's a, there's a virus. Um, it's obviously a, a much less bloody and, and less zombie uh, situation, but there is certain elements that you can't help but sort of say, Oh yeah, that is something that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of back of the mind, stressed out about it at all times uh, right now. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I guess the, the benefit is that that's, that's a very small part of the game and most of the time you're trying to stop spiders from shooting eggs down your neck or whatever, um, which, is, which has a lot less to do <laughs> with, the, with ordinary <laughs> life. But certainly those points of, of reflection are, are confronting. Definitely. Uh, you've got a, a three-year-old. I hope spiders that shoot eggs down your neck don't happen. I'm just putting that out there. I hope that doesn't, that doesn't <laughs> Me too, me that. too. <laughs> me too. That is when I will become an arachnophobic at that point. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, you've got a three-year-old at home um, as well as a, a, another baby. Um, and I'm curious uh, as to how you see the role of games in, in their lives and in their livelihood uh, moving forward. Is that an area that you think is going to become quite important to childhood development? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? Because, like, on the one hand, um, I feel like 
I'm a lot more liberal with a lot of things like that um, just because I, I grew up with them and it's that thing that you can't really not do where you're like, it was fine for me, it's fine for my kids. Like, But <laughs> on, the, on the other hand, I'm a lot stricter on a lot of things as well just because you know, I, I have to read and, and write about it all the time. I'm kind of, you know, I, I've seen some of the, the worst case scenarios um, of what, you know, even even TV or even screen time um, can do with the development of kids if you're not, you know, careful. Um, it's the same kind of thing where I, I find I use my phone a lot less than, than my wife does or than a lot of people do just because I'm, I'm hyper vigilant about my, you know, my relationship and my emotional dependence on things like social media and things like phones and so for kids um in one sense video games i loop them in with screen time in general because uh, i think a big part especially where my son is at the moment being three um, a big part of it is that if they're not actively engaging um you find that it it has a negative impact on their emotional state i think there's something about just like opening their brain and letting content fly in without really looking at it critically. There's something about that that um, isn't good for them. Uh, and I mean, I think that's that's pretty well backed up as well, um, just in terms of the, you know, the official guidelines for how much, you know, TV and, and screen time kids should be consuming. And, and with video games especially, I mean, there's so much convergence where, because we're all stuck at home and when we can't go to the library and we can't go to kinder or whatever, we started a program of, um, I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but it's basically an educational program that you can, you can use on, on a tablet or, or what have you. And it's, it's basically for, for really young kids, just getting them primed to understand numbers and colors and, and letters and stuff. And it's all, it, it just looks like iPad games, but it's designed to, you know, create those connections uh, between, you know, you know, this is the letter S, this is the noise it makes, all that sort of stuff. So in in practice, he's not doing much different than a game that just has them, you know, press the screen to, to pop bubbles. Um, but I think from an educational point of view, um, and especially since you are monitoring them and making sure they're engaged and, and their input is required to keep the thing going, um, I think there's a, a lot less of a danger of them just sort of you know, getting that face that you see kids when they're they're at the cafe and their parents have had, you know, so much on their plate for so long that they just give them the phone to, to deal with for a while and you see them just sort of go slack in the face and it just sort of all rushes into their brain. Um, I think over time we're going to appreciate how um, dangerous that is, and for adults as well as humans, because we do it as well. Um, I said adults and humans, but you know what I mean. Uh, but I think, <laughs> I think in the future... We, there's going to be a lot less barriers between that sort of stuff. The, it's going to be a bit like reading where you, you know, when we were in school, we would go to school and we'd have textbooks that we read from and we'd go home and we'd have novels or magazines or things that we read um, just for the fun of it, just because the topics interested us. I think that's going to be the same with, with interactive experiences, whether or not you call them games or not. Um, you know, you're going to go to school, there's going to be interactive experiences that you use controls or you use more likely touchpads and, and screens um, to sort of give you the lessons and to let you visualize things and to, to present things in a way that wasn't possible before because now you can tie input and vision and sound and rewards and all that sort of stuff together. They'll definitely have that. And then when you go home, um, maybe you'll have stuff that isn't quite as educational um, you know, to play as video games. But I must say, and, and this is only a fairly new area of research, I do believe that there's a base level of, you know, education in video games just because, you know, it's it's play on the one hand, which is always, it's always been the way that children learn so much about the world. Um, and then there's also things like hand-eye coordination and, you know, learning consequences and, and sort of interacting that way. So I think as long as we do keep looking into and keep understanding the negative effects that things like, um, you know, passive screen time have on brains and especially developing brains, I think there's no reason why um, interactive experiences in games are going to show up more and more and more in people's lives from a younger and younger age. Touching on that... that <laughs> Touching on that, uh, with, you know, 
I, I was always uh, brought up saying, look, you know, you've got half an hour or an hour on video games and then it's off. You know, like, you can't do that. And that, you know, was instilled uh, in me uh, from a really young age. Uh, and that was just how it was. Like, I was just like, yep, cool. Uh, now we've got it that, I mean, kids are on iPads and tablets and all this sort of stuff. And now... I can see that you've got like the uh, is it the the blue light glasses so that you can stay on tablets and computers longer now so that they don't hurt your eyes and all that is is that generally a good idea to be doing uh, and ha- what's your sort of uh, thoughts on uh, on technology and on uh, equipment that actually makes it that we can stay looking at screens for longer? <laughs> yeah, look, it's. It's tough because, I mean, obviously I, I do use a screen for like eight hours a day um, just just because that's how my job works. Um, and and I can understand the need for technologies like, um, you know, blue light glasses or like screens that can limit the amount of blue light. Um, but I think I think when it comes down to it, uh, it is it is dangerous and there's no way around it. And it's just because our bodies aren't designed for it. Like um, if you, if you kind of take the stance of imagining what our bodies are, uh, are made to do, and it's only been a couple of hundred years, if that, since we've sort of had the ability to, you know, go beyond that, uh, we, we haven't had time to evolve that quickly. Um, when a, I was, I was thinking about this a lot recently, obviously, because we, we had a baby and it always occurs to me that, you know, when a baby's first born, they're expecting a world that existed 500 years ago, you know, biologically speaking. They're not expecting um, even, uh, you know, lights. They're not expecting electricity. They're not expecting anything like that. So it, it's it's particularly worrisome when you see a product that's like a, a baby rocker that has like a spot for a phone in the top of it, which you do see at, at baby shops. And it's like, I don't, I don't see the benefit in in that you know their their eyes aren't designed for that you know their eyes are designed to look for contrasts and then identify faces and then you know learn a couple of faces and then identify smiles and go really slowly like that they're not they're not designed to watch you know dawson's creek from from the time (laughs) that they're a week old or whatever um so yeah there, there is definitely a disconnect whatever man you know you can show your kids dawson creek um, there, there's a disconnect with, with the way our bodies are designed and, and the way technology is going. But I, I think that's only going to, that's going to sort of, I don't, I don't see that skyrocketing off into the future because I think we're still kind of at the point where there are some people that don't really use technology all that much. Uh, and there are some people that are still getting to grips with it. Um, so it's really only a small subset of people, I think, that are being exposed to it all the time. And when those people are, you know, 80, assuming they get to that age, I think we're going to see a lot of stuff um, that we can point back to and say, oh, yeah, like, look at this person's eyes, like they're messed up, or look at this person's posture. Um, it's going to be no different from smoking or anything like that. We'll only get smarter and more knowledgeable as it goes in terms of integrating these things in a way that is less detrimental. And whether that means, you know, work screens that are more like, an e-ink screen, you know, more like printed paper um, that is, you know, a little better for you or stuff that's more ergonomic. Um, But like I said, I I don't think it's ever going to be healthy for people to passively, um, you know, consume content, whether that's, you know, watching a wrestling marathon for for 30 hours, which I'm sure I've done at some point when you just get (laughs) tired. Brenton has. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and you just get tired and, and the stuff's just washing over you, um, you know, and you find yourself, and I know this with video games as well, if you if you play for long enough and you're tired enough and you're not looking after yourself the way you should, your brain, you know, will try to force the rest of your life into the patterns of the video game that you've been playing, which, you know, on, on the one hand is, is pretty interesting, but on the other hand, I don't think is particularly healthy. Um, I think people first realized this after Tetris came out, but it, it works for, you know, just about any other game as well. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, back to the question, I think in the future we're going to be more aware of 
of the dangers of things like that. Um, and, and at the same time, we're still going to be, you know, have to be hyper vigilant um, when it comes to things like kids, because, you know, as always, uh, it's parents' jobs to try to make sure their kids stay healthy and stay safe, even though kids are going to do everything they can to, to circumvent that. They don't really understand um, things like that. You know, even, even my son is having a big issue at the moment where when something enjoyable is over, he just loses his absolute mind. And it's like that enjoyable thing <laughs> never existed. And all I've done is, you know, tell him that he'll never have it again and he'll never be happy. Uh, and he just sort of breaks down. Uh, but, you know, it's the solution isn't to say, well, OK, you can watch Peppa Pig for another eight hours or like, that's fine. You can watch me play Paper Mario 64 for the rest of the day, which I'd love, but I, I recognize isn't the best for him. You know, it's it's about recognizing um, what the limits should be and, and trying to enforce those. And, and also going back to, you know, saying you've only got half an hour to play games or whatever. I feel like. At the moment, that's easier than ever because all video game consoles now, you know, if you do the responsible thing and, and set them up before your kids can get their hands on them, um, they all have very easy to implement systems, uh, you know, to limit the, the kids' play time or to set daily curfews or to say, you know, they can only do this when I do this or put limits on their spending or like whatever it is. And as long as you can have you know, an honest discussion with your kid about those limits and why they're imposed, the, the console pretty much takes care of it for you. Um, so I, I feel like things like that are only going to be embraced more and more. Yeah, I mean, I think that your kid's crying because once Peppa Pig's over, uh, they know that you're about to put Dawson's Creek on. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is rather <laughs> upsetting. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> now I, I'm curious because your one of your areas you're the most interested in is uh, is uh, how societies function and the role of games in the functioning of society and how uh, people are interconnected with one another by different means and obviously now gaming plays a massive role in people's social interaction, particularly right now during the uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, did you ever see this coming, this, uh, this constant interconnectivity between humans via video games in the sense that, like, you can watch people on Twitch and there's communities just watching the streams and talking to each other in chat rooms and there's people screen sharing so they can play with others via Discord. Uh, video games have kind of become the new pub. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if anyone really saw it coming. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. Um, you know, early 2000s, I think that Nintendo basically said people don't want to connect their console to the internet. Like, um, you know, that, that was more or less the, the idea that you made games and they were distributed and you played them and they stayed the same, you know, forever. And, and it wasn't until, I guess, yeah, you know, obviously PCs, um, were, were connected a long, long time ago. Um, but in terms of mass market consumer stuff, I guess it wasn't until the first Xbox, and even then it was a fairly fairly niche thing. So it it did explode very quickly. Uh, and I think I think it's kind of a a mix of things that people did expect because even if you look at old sci-fi, like it's all about you know the Star Trek communicator, or it's all about people's heads magically appearing and you can talk to them. Um, or like video phones and things like that. Um, I guess what happened was that video games are just in the forefront of a lot of areas of technology, um, video games and pornography. Uh, yeah. And so it sort of just it sort of just developed that way. The, they had better internet, so they made games that took advantage of it. Um, they had you know a servers that could handle. A, a million people logging in and making changes and interacting with each other in real time. And so they rolled out things like, you know, World of Warcraft. Um, and I guess I'm just a little bit too old because I, I think a lot of that came through um, when I sort of had already been past the stage where I wanted to, you know, really experiment and get, and get the new thing and sort of work that stuff out with my friends. But for a lot of people, um, and it's not an age thing because there are a lot of people older than me that do it. But uh, for a lot of people, that is the the social space. That is the new, you know, sphere. And and I think, you know, there's 
there's every indication that uh, that's going to continue and it's going to sort of bridge outside of specific games. Whereas the moment sort of cross party chat is a thing, but for the most part, people are loading into games with their friends and talking while they play. Um, but, you know, things like house party or, or things like um, discord, they're, they're sort of growing in the way that people are going to be playing all sorts of different games and they're going to be able to be aware of what each other's doing and communicate and instantly sort of say, well, I want to do what you're doing and, you know, let's do it together. At the moment, I think there's still a bit too much friction. Like, unless you are hyper-focused and you've got your posse and you all play Destiny 2, um, I think there's a bit too much going on where you kind of have to keep track across multiple apps and usually with multiple bits of hardware. And, I mean, if you play with, with the Switch, you need a separate app and a, and a new headset and a, and a dongle that may or may not work and you need friend codes and you need, you know, all sorts of arcane um, black magic to get that working, but it's it's gonna <laughs> yeah it's gonna progress, um, and you know it's probably gonna hit other other me- entertainment mediums as well. Like I don't think anyone even considered having a Netflix party in it before the the you know the events of of recent weeks, but certainly once we're out of here, that's something Netflix is gonna be like. You know what? I think that's a thing that everyone's gonna want to do, and that's probably right. <laughs> Amazing. Well, this might be a good time to take a rad break um, and give you an opportunity to think about things that are a little bit more in keeping with your age group. (laughs) 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 So, uh, number one, what's less painful? Completing Turbo Tunnel in Battletoads or letting a scorpion sting your nipple? Um, I I think... I think... The, the scorpion is less painful um, because I can sort of I can sort of see I can sort of visualize how I'm going to get out of it like I can sort of see I know what I need to do I know that it's possible to do it um, and I can I can sort of see light at the end of the tunnel battle toads is, is impossible yeah I mean <laughs> so uh, I'm a huge retro gamer uh, battle toads being one of my favorite games Uh I, as an adult, almost cried with joy uh, when I got past the second level. Mm. Uh, So, I mean, it's definitely one of those things. I recently saw a video where someone had learnt the timing of the Turbo Tunnel and did it blindfolded. Uh, I also, in that same moment, realised that this person obviously doesn't have a life. Um, They are a robot. I'm yeah, like a they're a robot. Like, but, synthetic uh, I did see um I did see a meme uh, ages ago where it's uh the uh from Terminator two, uh where the Terminator and John Connor's talking to his uh his mum who's been the T one thousand and he asks him the question uh which was like, Oh, did you complete uh Battle Toads and the Terminator uh, uh, the T-1000 says, yes, with no lives lost. And then uh, it shows the Terminator saying, your mum is dead. Um, is dead. Yeah, so that was funny. Uh, going on with the rad break, uh, just to really test your skills uh, with this, how good are you at the Konami code off the top of your head? Uh, I don't cheat, so I'm not very good at it. Oh, see, that's at least oh. a good answer. That's a good answer. <laughs> that's a good <laughs> Okay, so, I would have so also always... go with I've never played Contra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were, I'm going to ask you a question that I'm not sure you're going to be able to answer, but I'm going to mm-hmm. ask you anyway. And that is, if I made you choose between C and Nintendo... What would you choose and why? Like, in the sense that only one of them existed, or in the sense that, like, I can I can only play one of them for the rest of my life? Yep, only one for the rest of your life. Um, I mean, I, I guess I'd choose Nintendo, just because they, <laughs> they have a, you know, a future of, of hardware um, ahead of them. I mean, it's one of those difficult things where you kind of, you end up weighing up you know, your childhood memories versus the actual reality of, of things. And, and my childhood was mostly Sega. 
Um, <laughs> That's just mine. And, and so it's sort of one of those things where I, I hold them so dearly. Um, and, you know, I never had a, a satin, but I have one now. And it's not for nostalgia. Like, I don't have any nostalgic attachment. I just got nostalgic attachment to the brand. So I had to get it. And I had to, you know, trick myself into believing that that version of Tomb Raider is better than the PlayStation version and sort of all these sort of uh, these myths. And, and the Dreamcast, obviously, it's a great console, but, you know, it's no, it's no GameCube. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, Sega, I think, has a lot of uh, good stuff. Uh, but they're they're not Nintendo, and I can I can happily admit that even as someone who you know whose sort of impulse is to to go to Sega every time, and someone who will just play Streets of Rage two for no reason when I know I should be doing other things, and I'm not getting anything out of it really. <laughs> yeah, look, it's it's one of those things. I mean, for instance. Uh, it, it's actually a law now that the only way that you can play Daytona is on the Saturn. I'm, I'm mm. hearing that if you play it on anything <laughs> other than the Saturn, there's a $1,600 fine. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm the exact same thing. So I grew up uh, strictly Nintendo. I had, I had the NES, the SNES, the 64, uh, and so on. Uh, but then as of uh, recently or over the last couple of years, started collecting uh, retro consoles to add to the collection. Having that disposable income as an adult, um, you know, I've found myself going back, hunting for Dreamcasts, hunting for Saturns, you know, uh, Sega CDs and stuff, all this stuff that I never had before, uh, and playing games that even down to, you know, playing, let's say, Judge Dredd on the Super Nintendo compared to on, you know, the Mega Drive, uh, and seeing the difference, amazing. Like, amazing <laughs> stuff there. It's um, all about so, the music with the, with the Mega Drive, I feel. Yeah. Like, whenever there's, a, whenever there's a sort of game that appeared on both, I'm like, how does this sound on the Mega Drive? Like, I bet there's just slap bass and just, like, those really <laughs> high-pitched guitar licks just, like, all over this. You know, you get into it and it's just like, and you're like, this is a Mega Drive game. I, I know this. <laughs> uh, so, one last question in the rad break. Uh, and obviously, with uh, a question like this, uh, miles may vary uh, with each person. But if you had to choose the three most difficult retro video games, what do you think they are? Um... It's tough because I mean, there's there's obviously um, there's obviously some that are like notoriously difficult that I just wouldn't recommend anyone actually play. Uh, so in terms of ones that like are worth playing but will kick your ass, I think maybe the original Castlevania, um, which just sort of just sort of ramps up just completely unnecessarily. Yeah, uh, to sort of to sort of destroy you. Um, trying to get some diversity here. Um, what about something like, um, you ever heard of Doshi and the Giant? No. The GameCube game. Uh, and and it's, it's mostly like, it's difficult because it's impossible to discern like what's happening. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like Seaman for the, for the Dreamcast in that regard. Like, it's it's not difficult to play. You're sort of just left there, but sort of to to wrap your brain around it and to try to sort of progress or to to see anything in it is um is sort of like an existential difficulty. Uh, and then let's just go with Road Rash, just because. Hell you know, yeah! Screw, screw that <laughs> yeah. game. Get Road yeah. Rash out of my face. Yeah. Oh look, I'm still stuck on. Uh, on you saying Castlevania and just remembering uh, the little uh, the Medusa heads that always seem yeah. to be floating just as you're trying to get to the next platform. They're so like, predictable <laughs> and it's somehow such a pain in the ass. I don't know yeah. how you can't just memorize where you need to go every single time. One of them will clip you in the foot or your whip and it'll hit nothing and you're just like, well, now I have to restart <laughs> the entire game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, this is a different kind of episode of adults we've done so far. But we better touch on uh, a couple of the things that we generally do each episode. And one of those, of course, 
is we ask our guests for their tips for being a Ruddolt. So, Tim, as a certified Ruddolt yourself, if people wanted to become just like you and be a super fancy writer for a super big publication about video games, how would they go about doing that? Um, well, I, I think, yeah, I, I, I don't think I did it sort of the, the usual way, but sort of if you want to do it the way I did it, you need to just find out what you are passionate about and what you really want to do um, and then sort of work out, you know, a way to do it. Like I, for to start with, I really just wanted to be um, a journalist. And, and more than that, I wanted to go to school at RMIT just because the program they had allowed a lot of, you know, um, philosophy and a lot of their stuff that I looked at. I was like, well, this isn't, you know, this isn't just sitting down and learning. This is actually basically just doing it. Um, and I had a really poor, um, you know, school score. I had like a, they called them N-scores scores at the time. I had like a 62 or something like that. Um, so I basically had to just work out a way to do it. And I went and studied PR for a while and I worked at a newspaper in Geelong and I worked at a newspaper out in the country and eventually, you know, I got to RMIT and then I sort of took it from there and, and reassessed and worked out which, you know, electives I was going to take to get me the kind of, the kind of skills that I wanted to have, the kind of, you know, um, I wanted to do a lot of philosophy and, and literary analysis i wanted to try to get some you know some video game stuff in there and then from from there it's really just a case of doing it you know and you should be doing it all the time if, if it's you want to make videos about you know games you like or you want to make um podcasts or you want to write you just need to do it and there's no you know there's no barriers to that now anyone can can get a website you don't even have to pay for it if you don't want everyone can start writing every day or start making video content every day making podcasts, whatever it is, there's a way to publish it and get it out there. Don't think about it as how do I be successful? How do I get this to a million people? Just think of it as refining your craft and getting better, you know, for you every single time. And then eventually people are going to, you know, find you. You're not even going to have to go and, and find them. Um, you're not even going to have to try to get a job at a big sort of traditional outlet. Um, you know, people who work at you know, IGN, just for an, as an example, are probably going to end up seeing your stuff because you're going to be doing stuff that other people aren't doing or you're going to be breaking stories or whatever it is that you're aiming to do. And it's going to give you so much more ammunition when you do find a, a job that you want or a thing that you want, whether you're asking someone to invest or whether you're asking someone to take, you know, your stuff and, and run with it and pay you for it, you're going to have a whole body of work and an entirely unique point of view um, that's going to, you know, make you more attractive. Absolutely. Uh, so we've, we've touched on the coronavirus a little bit uh, in this episode. Uh, obviously, it's affecting the world and everything like that at the moment. Uh, if you were to recommend a handful of games for people that uh, should be checking out uh, during this time, during uh, their time staying at home and self-isolating, what games right now would you be telling people to check out? Um, Resident Evil 3. No, don't, don't play Resident <laughs> Evil 3. Um, I, I kind of, like I already said, I kind of always go back to, to retro games as a, as a sort of, I don't know, it's, it's sort of my coping mechanism, I guess. And I, I, again, it's not a, it's not a nostalgia thing. Like I, I enjoy playing old games that I never played. I just find that, um, it's less of a, it's less of a big flashy entertainment medium and more of a you know the core is about the gameplay and about the you know the challenges and and even if it's not a very difficult game it's it's about you know learning the rules of the game and then applying them to situations which is what i play video games for and so i wouldn't necessarily recommend people you know go out and get a super nintendo because they they probably don't you know, have a way to hook it into their TV that, that makes sense. But certainly, if you're interested, I would say look into ways to get at old video games with what you have. If you have a PS4 or an Xbox or a Switch, look for the, the Sega Mega Drive collection, which has a whole bunch of old games, which some of them you probably would never have heard of before. Um, but I find it really cathartic to, you know, learn those systems and, and, and apply them. Uh, but, you know, 
new games do that as well. I just finished playing um, Ori and the Will of the Wisps, which is a, a beautiful game. Uh, it, it looks amazing. It sounds amazing. It has a really sort of emotional story, but the core of the gameplay is is very old school. And you mentioned uh, Celeste. That's very much the same way. Um, you know, and it's it's one of those things where it's punishingly difficult, but it it doesn't actually punish you. It's it's very clever in the way that it supports you because it it, it knows that you you know are embarking on this journey and you want to get better. And so it's not like those old video games where it just wants to slap you in the face and say get better, get better, get better. Um, you know, a lot of new indie games, especially platformers, uh, are getting a lot better. So I guess. My uh, suggestion is to get whatever device you have um, and, and load up the store, see if you can find a, you know, a platformer or an old school RPG that you know, maybe isn't as, as big and glitzy, but is something that you can really get better at and, and sort of get that feeling that you've accomplished something. I mean, what, we've got like Streets of Rage 4 out on the right. Switch? So, <laughs> you know, we might not have to check that out. I don't know yet. That's a scary one to think about. <laughs> yeah. Did you see, did you see the um, the twelve unlockable characters that are just sprites from previous games? <laughs> yeah. Where you've got like all the enemies are just like these beautiful hand drawn and like lit characters, and then there's just like Zan from Streets of Rage Three <laughs> from like thirty years ago, and he's still got lighting on him, but he's just pixels. I love it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, look and. At the moment, I guess a recommendation I would have if anyone does want to uh, pick up the old uh, retro consoles uh, and they've got a little bit of uh, money to spend would be to get an old CRT TV. You know, I don't think that a, a SNES or a NES or anything like that plays better on anything but that. Uh, but then at the same time, if, if an income's a bit of an issue and if you're not a gaming elitist uh you could also look at uh an emulator based console like the retron 5 or something like that well i mean i guess i guess the the difficulty is the need for um original cartridges if you have if you have a lot of cartridges lying around something like the retron 5 is awesome well i mean if you've got a lot of cartridges and heaps of money you could get an analog system um but yeah if you can get a crt then the sky's the limit you know grab a Grab a 64, grab a, you know, Super Nintendo, grab a Mega Drive, get a um, Dreamcast, you know, whatever you want. Or even if you if you have a HDTV and you want to go old school, grab a PS2. You can get component cables for that. It looks great. You can play PS1 games on it. Um, it's sort of, even though we can't really go outside or go to the shops, there's so many places online where you can, you know, put together a, a basket of, of old retro goodies. It'll be in your house, you know, in a week. Um, why not experiment with stuff like that? Yeah, it's 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 oddly strange. I went to uh, EB Games yesterday, uh, and they were open. Uh, and I was like, oh, I wasn't sure you guys would be open. They go, oh, well, people are finding us essential. And <laughs> I said, at what point? Like, what what sort of uh, thoughts were put into that when that was the thing? He goes, well, we've been busy. And I said, how? And he goes, people are looking for new hobbies. People are looking to uh, ignite an old flame that they had with gaming, uh, teach their kids about gaming, all different things. Like, he goes, uh, we've made more sales today alone than what we have, you know, uh, the weeks before uh, all this happened, you know, be it online, uh, click and collect, or people coming into the store. So it was very... It was very weird walking into a shopping center where nearly every store was shut and just seeing that bright EB Games uh, logo and the doors open. Yeah, it's nuts. Don't go to the store, people. <laughs> people bring that stuff to you. We, we've, got, we've got systems for this, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well... I think we should probably let you get back to living your life as much as we could probably geek out and talk to you about video gaming forever. Um, and no doubt will. And I will continue to uh, flood your inbox every now and then with questions about which thing I should buy. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just finished my, my, uh, my 64. I've been making a 64 setup for a while that I can use 
on a HDTV. It's taken me a long time. And now I can't invite anyone over for, for GoldenEye. So it's just sort of sitting there. Been playing uh-huh. Paper Mario. That's about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, terrible, terrible times. So we might, we might wind this one up. Tim, and I'll, uh, I'll let you live your fantastic life and get back to your lovely 64. Uh, thank you for coming on the podcast and for being a rattle today. I've had great fun talking to you, um, and I promise you I'll leave it at least a week until I message you saying, hey, man, I'm considering which one of these futuristic new consoles to buy. Which one would you recommend? <laughs> Yeah, uh, so we'll let you get back to Dawson's Creek uh, is what Brenton's trying to say there. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, thank you very much for uh, coming on to the podcast. It was a blast. I'm going to make myself a hot cup of hot chocolate and get into bed and watch that sweet, sweet teen action. <laughs> there you go. And that brings to an end another episode of the Reynolds Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed your time with us today and that you've left the episode feeling even more inspired to turn your own creative dreams into reality. As always, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, follow, and share our content. And go out there and live life a little more rattled. Have a rad day.